Welcome everyone to today's health policy update sponsored by MHAM. I'm Kristen Taylor and I'm with the Mental Health Association in Michigan. For the next hour, we're going to have discussion around several topics with health policy. If you have questions, please drop them in the chat. And we'll also be taking some questions um, as the topic at hand is being discussed. So um, we'll stop, we'll pause, we'll ask you to unmute yourself if you have some questions. Um, but until then, we do ask that you make sure that your line is muted. Um, we have a ton of topics today that are intriguing. And so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. With us is Marianne Huff, CEO and president of the Mental Health Association in Michigan and uh, MHAM lobbyist, Stephanie Johnson, who is partner with Corey Johnson and Levitt. Ms. Huff is an LMSW and has 20 years of leadership experience, including 12 years of executive level staff leadership and advocacy within the behavioral health field. Prior to MHAM, Marianne served as the executive director for a rural CMH and as the director of advocacy for the Ability Center of Greater Toledo in Ohio. Additionally, as an advocate at the Michigan Protection Advocacy Service, now known as Disability Rights Michigan, Marianne helped individuals and families access mental health services and uses her personal lived experience to optimistically and passionately lead, advocate, and educate to improve the lives of those with behavioral health challenges and eliminate barriers to the timely and effective treatment of severe mental illness. Also with us, Ms. Johnson, she specializes in labor, agriculture, education, and human services issues with her firm. Her attention to the finer details of each relationship she builds has garnered her the respect and admiration of lawmakers and clients alike. Stephanie's dedication extends to each project she tackles and is known for her ability to understand issues and the people behind them. And the lawmakers know they can trust her word and expertise. Welcome to both of you. It's great to be here today and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us on a Monday afternoon to talk about mental health public policy. Um, it's great to see so many of you here today. I um, also want to thank Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie has been um, the lobbyist for MHAM for a very long time and invaluable to the work that we do. So what I want to say before I start getting into different topics um, that are out there right now is that um, things have been it's kind of an interesting comment I'm going to make. Things have been slow, but they haven't been slow. And what I mean by slow is that there hasn't been a lot in the way of mental health legislation that's been introduced. Uh, mental health legislation that was previously introduced hasn't really, not, not a lot's been happening with it. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what the fall brings. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, the bills that are out there, including um, a new bill that was introduced by Representative Graham Filler. Um, and we'll also update you at least what we can on some other mental health legislation that's been out there for a while. For a while. Uh, that would be the legislation introduced by Representative Mary Whiteford actually in 2021 and the legislation introduced by Senator Mike Shirky also in 2021. But before we get into all of that, for my portion, what I, what I really wanna start with is talking about the Detroit Free Press articles. I don't know how many of you were able to see the articles that appeared in the Detroit Free Press, um, not this past weekend, but the weekend previous. They were written by investigative reporter Jennifer Dixon, and Jennifer did a very thorough job looking at pretty much the, the recipient rights system in our state. Looks like it took her over 15, 16 months to do her research and put it all together. Unfortunately, you know, what I will say about recipient rights, and, and I guess I should probably qualify this because I, I don't want to assume that everybody knows on this call knows what recipient rights is. In the public mental health system, we have, in, and it's also outlined in chapter seven and seven A of what's called the Michigan Mental Health Code, is the rights of recipients, the rights of persons served, and what their rights 
actually are. The whole point of that is to make sure that anybody who is um, receiving services or including their family um, is treated with dignity and respect. And there's a whole lot of rights, right to not have to be experiencing abuse or neglect. One of the things that we've confronted a lot within public mental health as far as recipient rights goes is that in and Jennifer Dixon's two articles, one on September 9th and the other one on September 11th, highlight the conflict of interest that's inherent in community mental health recipient rights system. And what that means is that ultimately, we have 46 community mental health services providers in the state, and the rights directors or officers report to the executive director of the CMA. In the same way in the hospital, psychiatric hospitals, or in the inpatient units, the rights officers report to the CEO of the hospital. So you can imagine that if something doesn't go well and there's a rights violation, then in essence, the hospital is in a way investigating itself. Um, it's up to the executive director of the CMH to decide if there is a substantiated rights investigation. The CEO or the CMH director is the one who's responsible for deciding what the consequence should be depending upon the violation. One of the things that has been advocated by that advocates have wanted for a very long time um, is to have a central rights office that's housed at the state of Michigan. We haven't, that hasn't happened. In other words, rather than having the recipient rights officers reporting directly to either the CMH directors or the hospital CEOs, instead having all the rights officers report directly to the state rights director so that we could have um, more autonomy for the rights officers and a lot less conflict of interest. And if you get a chance to read Jennifer Dixon's story, what you see in there, particularly um, the story on September 9th really focuses on things that happen in the state, either the psychiatric hospitals or in the psychiatric units. And there's a story in there about a rights officer named Jonathan Bennett, um, who was with Northern Lake CMH and um, was terminated from his job for doing his job. And you can read more about that in the free press. You know, I think the other part that we see highlighted in these articles is something that there's definitely a lack of accountability in some respects within community mental health, whether it be within the CMH system itself in terms of you know, the CMHs or at the at the hospital level, there's a lack of accountability. Um, back in 20, 2020, 2019, the Mental Health Association in Michigan was concerned about death reporting in the psychiatric hospitals and on in the inpatient units. And so we started doing our own study around how those deaths were being reported. We actually submitted a Freedom of Information Act request for years 2019 through 2020. And it was interesting, the number of deaths that actually were not investigated and also the number, the, the reporting form itself did not seek to obtain a lot of information that would have been very valuable to the investigation. So. These are things that um, we at MHAM are paying a lot of attention to. Um, one more comment, the story on September 11th um, talks about, um, her name was Bridget Kavanaugh, and it looks like she was living in an unlicensed setting, and unfortunately she passed away. One of the things that we see frequently, unfortunately, is uh, individuals with more significant disabilities who are living either some, sometimes independently or in very specialized residential settings where the care isn't is substandard. And I've worked with many individuals over the years uh, where the care given to their loved one, their son, daughter was very um, subpar. And the frustration for the family and also for myself as an advocate- 
seemed to be very little that we could actually do to affect change because a lot of times these providers um, were, were known for working with individuals who had a higher level of acuity in terms of their needs or behavioral health conditions. However, one would think that the higher the level of acuity and the fact that they're getting paid at a higher rate of reimbursement, that the care would be better. And unfortunately, um, it often was not better. So if you get a chance um, to look at those articles from the Detroit Free Press, I would tell you to absolutely do so. Um, from our point of view, we need to take a long look at the way that the recipient rights system is currently configured in our state. We being advocates and anyone who believes that there's definitely an inherent conflict of interest with the way that rights is currently carried out. There's actually, um, in some respects, there's quite a bit of conflict of interest in the current public mental health system, but we're not gonna get into all that today. The other, the other issue that MHAM has been paying a lot of attention to is um, what's known as the KB versus Lion lawsuit. Um, in the event that not everybody's aware of what that lawsuit is, um, KB was a lawsuit that was filed in 2018. Um, it was filed by Michigan Protection and Advocacy, which of course now known as Disability Rights Michigan. Um, an attorney named David Honigman and his firm, and an attorney named J.J. Conway. Basically, it was filed because um, children and youth age 21 and under were not getting the supports and services that they need in order to stay out of more restrictive setting, which would be institutions. And because these children and youth were not able to access these vital services, such as we have a service called Community Living Supports, which is designed to help individuals with more significant disabilities to stay in the community, respite for families so that they can get a break, parent support partners for parents who need support as they're trying to navigate their children's behavioral health conditions. What happened with KB was that those services and supports were not available. And so um, a lawsuit was filed. Now we're in 2022. There's been an interim you know, settlement agreement since 2020, I believe. In there, the state has created what they call the My Kids Now program. And they also created the Bureau of Children's Coordinated Health Policy and Supports. Um, originally, they created a children's ombudsman's office, but now they have what's called the Office of the Advocate for Children, Youth, and Families, and it's headed up by a woman named Patricia Neatman, um, and so that whole program is under development. There's also going to be a um, clinical support and service navigation section, from what I understand, um, a person with a clinical background that will be a troubleshooter to help when there's um, issues occurring with specific individuals, cases, families across the state. So we're really looking forward to the implementation of that section as they are sort of putting themselves together because this is a brand new division or bureau in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, back in March, um, the Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities Administration, which had been headed up by Al Jansen, went away and um, the whole thing was sort of recreated. Um, there is no Behavioral Health Developmental Disabilities Administration anymore. Um, the head of the Ch Bureau of Children's Coordinated Health Policy and Supports is Lindsay McLaughlin. And, um, there's quite a few individuals that are looking at children's services from a variety of perspectives. We're also looking forward to children who are in foster care having the ability to access community mental health services in a much easier way. Um, so we're looking forward to the way that this is gonna roll out. 
The final thing is that we do have one bill, actually it's going to be um, heard at the House Health Policy Committee tomorrow, and this is House Bill 6355. Um, this would amend the Michigan Mental Health Code, and basically what it does is it says that, you know, if, um, so first of all, a community mental health services program, they're the ones that for any Medicaid beneficiary in our state, they do the pre-admission screening for inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. And they're supposed to be doing these assessments in a reasonable time. Um, and now they're saying, you know, they have to do them in three hours. The problem is, as you can imagine, there are times that the CMH is able to meet that standard and there are times it's not able to meet that standard. So what Representative Fillers rep uh, legislation basically says that if the pre-admission screening unit cannot complete the assessment within three hours, then the hospital can use a clinically qualified individual to perform the assessment and they outline who can do it. It's outlined in uh, the public health code um, and that would be done at the expense of the CMH. So the reason that we are in favor of this type of legislation is because a lot of times these assessments do not get done in a timely manner. Um, and if somebody is, whether it be an adult or a child, someone is in a hospital emergency room and they're having struggling psychiatrically, um, it can be very overwhelming to be in that emergency room while you're struggling, waiting for an assessment. Of course, we also know, we've heard a lot about the, uh, the problem with emergency room, um, what we call onboarding, where it's difficult to find a bed, a psychiatric bed, but also we have the issue of getting those assessments done in what we would consider to be a timely manner. So I um, wanted to bring that this legislation to the attention of everybody as well. I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie Johnson for any, for her insights. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as I was, uh, as it was indicated when I was introduced, I represent the uh, Mental Health Association and represent them here at the Capitol uh, before the legislature and the governor's office. And we work to try to do our advocacy to promote good public policy that helps um, create a better system for the people who are being served by it and their families. We have a lot going on. Um, as Marianne indicated, there's um, little happening, but yet a lot's going on. And it's sort of a hard thing to, to understand. But you know, we have legislation in play. Um, that uh, There has been some legislation introduced by Senator Shirky and Representative Whiteford. Um, Mary Whitefoot, who would uh, make some changes, some pretty broad changes to the mental health system as a whole, uh, with with the goal in mind of integration of services. Um, that's been a conversation for a long time around Lansing is how do we, uh, can we create a system that is more integrated between behavioral health and physical health, and how do we combine this in a manner that makes sense and uh, provides good service to those who are with, utilizing the services. No one's ever, no one at this point has kind of come up with the best panacea. Um, the two bill packages address the issue in different uh, manners, but we can, we can say, or we're hopeful that the two bill sponsors will come together and maybe come up with an, a, a compromise between the two that might have a chance at passing before the end of this year. We don't know if that's going to happen. The, there's what we call the legislative time clock, um, and it's ticking, and the ticking is getting louder and louder and louder. So one of the things I want to do is give you a little bit of an idea of what we're dealing with in the legislature with it being an election year, and what we plan and what we um, predict for the outcome of the remaining legislative session and what we think might happen in the new year. Um, right now, obviously, we're in uh, election season, 
and we have all the statewide offices up for election. We have the Senate and the House up for election. Um, in Michigan, we have 110 House members. We have 38 senators. Uh, in the House, just the House itself, we will probably have 55 new legislators elected, maybe more um, coming into office January 1. So what that means for us is come January 1, we've got a lot of new faces that we need to get to know um, and rely on and try to educate and get them interested in uh, mental health policy and, and um, work with them within whatever capacity that they're selected for as far as committee chairs and, and committee assignments. Um, that's a lot. That's a pretty heavy lift in of itself. 55 new people um, it is a pretty big load, particularly when you're dealing with 110 total. Um, this year, we're not anticipating a whole lot of session days left. Um, the legislature's in session Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Um, right now, they have not been in session um, this month. They're going to. They're planning on being in a couple of days next week, uh, and and they're having. They have session where they um, take. They they don't take attendance and they don't vote, uh, but they can introduce legislation. And so that's what's been happening for most of this month. We anticipate that for probably the majority of next month as well, largely because they're home. They're campaigning. Um, and and they're they're running for re-election. This year, legislators who are running for re-election have an even bigger challenge than normal because we have redistricting that has taken place. So many of these legislators are running in brand new districts uh, for re-election or um, trying to get to know different communities and and um, work with different uh, voters in that way. So we have a few committees. Um, meetings that are going to take place this week, maybe a couple next week. That's a, this is a long way of saying we have maybe 12 session days left for them for the year. Uh, ses a legislative session runs in the two year cycle. We're coming up on the end of the second year. Anything that doesn't pass and get to the governor's office this year will have to be reintroduced in the next new legislative session. So the bills that we have been working on, if for whatever reason they don't make it across the finish line, we will need to find new sponsors and new folks to want to take those issues on and pass those and, and, and work at it, start basically all over again. Um, so we are having, you know, we have challenges here with the legislature just because of term limits and the turnover you it's really tough when you get uh, really good individuals who care about the issue and they they really take their time and learn it and then if they're in the house six short years later they're gone and you have to start that all over again um we will be we we know that there's going to be a few issues that just aren't going to make it over the finish line by the end of the year and we'll have to start all over again. In addition to that, you know, obviously any good policy that gets enacted or passed, you have to have a, a, a worthy or a, 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 an appropriation to match it that makes that allows you to put the policy into place. So we've had some appropriations. Um, I don't want to call them challenges because we've we've had a, a year, a last couple years, where our budget um, fiscally has been fairly well sound. Uh, we've, the legislature and the governor's office has had some funds that they were not, they would not have anticipated three, four years ago. Some of those are largely due to the uh, federal dollars that came in based on COVID. Um, some of that was, you know, people did not stop spending during COVID. Um, and so the sales tax and um, the income tax and all that remained fairly healthy for us um, over the last couple of years. Do we think that's going to continue? No. Um, but the legislature has had a significant amount of funds to allocate, um, and they've been trying to be really judicious about how they do so in the sense that they don't want to allocate these dollars 
for programs that are going to require ongoing funding because there's no way to guarantee or to know that these the healthy revenues that we have coming into the state are going to be maintained next year and the following year so if they put it into a program where it has to be sustained for a long period of time there's there's a very good chance that they won't be able to sustain it so they've been looking at opportunities for one time uh, that they could put resources in that are going to be one time. Psychiatric bed is one of the, uh, some of those areas where they're going, they've been looking at trying to enhance the number of beds, although that will require ongoing funding. But that's been one that they've really been trying to uh, look into, trying to create some incentives for people to go into the professions that deal with mental health issues. That's another area that's been a huge problem for. Um, for Michigan and for any other state, frankly, across the United States, we have a shortage of providers. And it's one thing to have all these services available to individuals, but if you don't have providers in the network that can provide the services, you're still not any further ahead. And so we've got a lot of challenges trying to balance all of that going forward. Um, so we're hopeful that uh, this next election cycle uh, goes well and we can have some new champions to identify in the new legislative session. Uh, we've had some very strong champions over the last two years for sure that have really wanted to dig in and work on these issues and know that we've got some significant challenges out there. Um, we have uh, issues on as far as consistency across diff varying CMHs across the state. Uh, Marianne alluded to accountability. Um, how do we hold the people who are providing these services accountable? If they're getting resources and they're, they've signed up to provide this, how, how are we uh, ensuring that they're in fact doing what they're supposed to do? Um, so those are the areas that we're really focusing strongly on and working with our legislative partners. I'd like to encourage everybody who, are, who is on this call to Always know who your legislator is, your House member, your senator. Get in contact with them. Go to their coffee hours. Um, pick up the phone and talk to their staff. And, and keep working this and, and bringing them aware of any challenges you're facing and areas for which that we, you know, they need to focus on. Um, we get our best champions oftentimes in the legislature through uh, grassroots, through family members who have contacted their certain legislator and given them their story. And all of a sudden, then you have a legislator who's wanting to see what they can do about this and, and get involved and get active. And that works really well for us. It helps us tremendously. We can connect with that person and we can help start guiding them, giving them ideas, giving them information to help shape the policy that they want to run with. Um, so the, that concludes my thoughts and I'm open to take any questions that anybody may have. Stephanie mentioned um, Senate bills 597 and 598, which are the, the Shirky bills and then House bills 4925 through 29, which are Representative Whiteford's bills. One of the things that is interesting, I'm going to start with Senator Shirky's bills, is that those bills are solely focused on integration of physical and behavioral health care, whatever that's primarily through the payer. Um, we have at MHAM, we have a public policy committee, but, but in that committee, we also have an integrated care work group. And we recognize that there needs to be some effort to move toward integrated care. It's, it's not whether we should or shouldn't, it's about what it should look like. Um, as I indicated in the chat, I've been doing research on the different laws, you know, seeing around the United States, who has integrated care actually in law. And one of the states that has one of the best um, statutes regarding integrated care is um, the state of Washington. And myself and some other partners have been taking a long look at these different laws and what would it mean for Michigan? Um, Michigan is one of the few states in the country that really doesn't have any sort of strategic plan around integrated care and knowing how we would even get there. And that's something that um, we're concerned about at MHAM. 
one thing we do know is that integration through payer is not the best way to achieve integration in terms of there's a lot of other factors that need to be considered. There's a lot of models out there too. So I think that we all need to come together, all healthcare, to kind of figure this out. And the reason I'm belaboring the point is I want to draw a distinction between what Representative White Bill Whiteford's bills do and Senator Shirky's bills. Representative Whiteford bills, on the other hand, um, her bill is fo primarily focused on elimination of the current prepaid and patient health plans. Um, we have 10 what's called PIHPs in the state. They manage the Medicaid for the 46 CMHs. We have seven multi-county prepaid and patient health plans. And a PHP, by the way, is a managed care organization is defined by the federal government. Her bills would eliminate the 10 and create a single statewide administrative services organization that would manage the dollars. Actually, the ASO would answer to what's called a basically a behavioral health oversight committee can, it has a lot of different entities that would be participants in that, and they would then work directly with the state of Michigan. Representative Whiteford's bills don't really talk a lot about integration. Um, they talk more about what do we do with a system that seems to have a lot of administrative costs attached to it. And going back to the lack of accountability, how do we fix that? So I just wanted to clarify that as well for everybody. And as Stephanie said, we don't have any knowledge of any agreements or, you know, even if they're actually going to reach any type of an agreement about what they're, if they were working together, what it would actually even really look like. So that's really up in the air. We're grateful yep. though that we've had um, over the last few years, a lot of interest in this area. And I don't see that dying off, uh, even as we go into the next legislative session starting January 1, I still see mental health issues being uh, one of the top tier priority issues going forward. I think that there's still, legislators get a lot of calls from their district um, about concerns and problems and challenges people are having. And so the more that's been happening, the more people are looking at what we have, how it's structured and where these problems are, are being, um, are, are rooted in, so to speak. So I see these issues going forward and I'm grateful for that because it's been a while. I, I know for years and years and years, we tried to get these on the radar so to speak and and for whatever reason to to there it was a challenge but now they're on most everyone's radar yeah i just want to add to what stephanie said you know um been around for a long time in the system in some way shape or form and i think that one of the good things to come out of covid if something good can come out of covid was an understanding of the fact that we really do need to be focusing a lot more on mental health. Um, it's interesting. Um, so the Mental Health Association in Michigan, we are actually an affiliate of a national organization called Mental Health America. And back in 2020, we started um, having a link to the Mental Health America's website. Um, on their website, they actually have a variety of mental health um, screening tools. They're not assessments, they're screening tools. And if you go on to our website and click on a tab called resources, and it will take you to that page. The cool thing about this is that MHAM, we get the de-identified data from those screenings. And we recently got data from, from like 2019, 2019, January 1st through the end of 2021, and the data was quite disturbing. Over 88,000 Michigan residents took those screenings over those couple of years. And what we saw was that the, the, the age group that took the screenings most frequently in that data set was between the ages of 11 and 17. The next group was between the ages of 18 and 24. And then the next group was 25 to 32, I believe. 
what was interesting too when you look at the data and i can certainly send this um to people who are interested is that what was interesting about it is of course depression is number one for that data set anxiety is number two and then of course bipolar disorder but recently where we had um we get our data quarterly the most recent data that we got for the period march april and may no April, May, and June of this year was interesting because the group that took the screenings the most was 18 to 25. And the first diagnosis was depression. And, and usually what, what Mental Health America does is it, we get a sense of the severity. A large number of individuals um, screened as being in the more moderate to severe range for depression. But instead of anxiety being number two, the second one was bipolar disorder. The third one was anxiety, but right up there was first episode psychosis and eating disorders. So we know we have significant issues among um, our young people, especially. Another interesting piece of data that we got actually last year from Mental Health America. Uh, Mental Health America was rating the top 10 or 20 counties in the United States that scored very high with rates of depression. And two of those top counties came from Michigan. One was Isabella County, which is where Mount Pleasant is. Actually, number two or three in the nation was Baraga County in our state. So to Stephanie's point, we're grateful that there is a spotlight now on mental health. We know that we have a shortage, as Stephanie um, you know, was talking about. We have a shortage of mental health professionals, but I also want to make sure we talk about the fact that we have a shortage of direct care workers as well. Um, so... For example, I was speaking earlier about KB versus Lion and those services that keep kids out of, say, Hawthorne Center or out of, you know, out of the institution. Um, the issue is, is that if you don't have people that are willing to provide the services in the community, then how do you keep individuals out of those institutional settings? One thing that's interesting to, to me about the mental health system in our state, and I'm sure it's probably true around the country, is that everything is interconnected. So if something isn't working like over here, it's not going to probably work over here. You know, we have another issue in our state, particularly for children and youth, we have a lack of a continuum of care. In other words, you know, we have outpatient services, and then if a child needs or a youth needs to be inpatient for an acute crisis, they can go to community hospital. But we have one state hospital for kids in the state called Hawthorne Center, and it has a waiting list. And fortunately, there's allocation in the budget to open up some more beds at Hawthorne. But if we have this crisis occurring where individuals, where families are really struggling because they have these kids with these severe behaviors, but they can't get in-home services, you know, the question becomes what, you know, what do they do? So these problems existed in many ways pre-COVID. For example, KB was filed in 2018 and we didn't have COVID till 2020, but the pandemic certainly brought this whole issue of mental health and well-being to the forefront in large part too because all of us that live we've all lived through it you know are all experiencing some after effect not everybody but i would say probably a large percentage of us are dealing with some after effect because it's it's not even technically over yet and that definitely does affect the mental health and well-being of everybody so we have a question here, Stephanie, you answered the question about public events coming up. Do you wanna to speak to that? Yes, um, you know, the question was posed, what's kind of the most effective way to work with legislators and um, get them interested and engaged? And I, I believe I'm a very old school and I think it's still the best approach. It's the one-on-one -on -one, face to face. Uh, days at the Capitol, um, rallies and such, they're fine. 
but I don't see them as effective as they once were. I think 10 years ago, you could have a rally, have 30 people show up and it kind of made an impact. I don't see that making an impact anymore. Um, I really believe the reaching out um, via phone or a one-on-one -on -one is still your best, your best avenue to get um, to, to get things done, to get the attention, to get the interest, and to work with them. Uh, most legislators have coffee hours in their district. They have there. There's usually opportunities to sit down with them and talk. If they if you can't find that, just call their office and schedule it. Um, again, even if it's by phone, uh, I still think that's the most effective way. Yeah, I want to add to what Stephanie said. I think building the relationships with legislators is really important. Um, and I think one of the tasks that MHAM will have, along with some of the other advocacy organizations, since we're going to have a lot of new people coming into the House and the Senate, um, is educating them about mental health issues and about how our current mental health system is set up. You know, it's going to be really important that we, those who um, care about these issues, that we're introducing ourselves early on to legislators once we see who's going to become reelected November. Um, and when they take their office, you know, they begin in January, it'll be important to start working with them. Um, because as Stephanie indicated, we have some people who um, we would consider to be mental health champions. You know, one of them is Representative Mary Whiteford. Um, she is term limited out. And so her tenure ends this year along with some other folks. So I think getting to know them one-on-one -on -one is probably the best way. And also holding yourself out as somebody that can be helpful to them in terms of helping them to understand the system and how it's affected you or your loved one, if that's um, what you're concerned about. So like issues, you know, another thing that has been a big issue and it's highlighted in House Bill 4925, which is Rep. Whiteford's legislation, is self-determination. And self-determination is a concept um, that really allows the family and the person served to be in the driver's seat when it comes to services. Um, this is um, something that has typically self-determination arrangements have been offered in some counties, CMHs, but not in others. And so, you know, we're, we're hoping that it is being offered across the board. We also hope that self-directed, um, self-determination, self-directed services will be offered as frequently to individuals with mental health conditions, adults and children, um, typically speaking, um, self-determination has not always um, been offered to children with serious emotional disturbance or adults with mental health, more significant mental health conditions. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to perhaps seeing that offered unilaterally across the board to all population groups that would like to choose that. Stephanie, do you want to talk about the potential for a supplemental in late November, December? <laughs> oh boy, um, put me on the spot. Um, there is uh, a significant amount of money that went on appropriated when the legislature agreed to in the, and passed the fiscal year 2022-23 budget. So there's money left on the table to continue to spend. Um, and so when they do that, they do it in what they call a budget supplementals, um, budget supplemental. So there is a high probability that there will be a budget supplemental at some point this year left yet before the end of the year. Uh, there could be more than one, but I believe there will be at a minimum one. Uh, now, we don't know for a certain if that will be next week or after the election, uh, but I do believe it is going to come. Uh, we are still trying to figure out the details of what might be the topic of discussion between the governor's office and leadership in the House and Senate. 
um, they are still actively talking about what they want and and what they um, are, where their priorities are individually and where they can kind of reach some consensus. So we are anticipating a supplemental. Could be next week. Could be after the election. Um, or could be both. So that's it's hard for us to talk about it because that's about the best detail we can provide at the moment. Um, I think that is uh, about what I have as far as detail for the budget supplemental. Um, are there any other, I see another question. What are some groups or is, give them help, a voice, or concerns around mental health care. Um, there's a lot of organizations out there. Obviously, they all have their specific um, agenda, so to speak, or, or focus. Uh, you have, obviously, the Autism Alliance, and they have a very specific focus. You have, um, and you know, obviously, Mental Health Association of Michigan is sort of the umbrella organization, and we we really work on all of those issues in, in the system as a whole. Um, and then we have um, the Disability Network um, and some others. So any organization, ARC is one, obviously. So any organization that fits the um, goals and the focus that you believe is important and, and needs attention or is something that you want to dedicate any amount of personal time or money to obviously would be more uh, would be more than appropriate. Um, I don't think it changes anything that we relate to you today as far as if you want to take action, get involved in how best to communicate with the decision makers and I still believe it's the one on one. Uh, but doing so in conjunction with an association or organization just makes you stronger. Uh, and, and it's really good to get broad change done when you have a number of organizations and a number of people kind of hitting the same issue or hitting the same, uh, we call them speaking points. And I don't say that to trivialize it in any way, but if we all have the same message, uh, oftentimes for any of us to pay attention to anything and to really kind of have it grab our attention, we have to hear it two, three, four times, and we have to hear it from different places or different platforms. And so being on the same message for the advocacy organizations involved is really important. We try to work really hard with the other associations and organizations so that we are one voice and we do come with all of our individual groups and memberships to show a large uh, support or a large um, constituency that is impact, impacted and wanting to see the change that we're working on. Kate, okay, you have a question if you wanna go ahead with that. Okay, thank you. And I, you may have uh, already talked to this, my internet has been uh, in and out and I missed mm -hmm. some things, but <clears throat> it's sort of along the line, speaking to some of the same points and, and areas that really need addressing and and also incorporating into that that sometimes the only way we get action is through lawsuits like Kevin's law and, and some of the others in that is my ham or any other agency able to collect um, complaints from individuals because most you know families do not have the wherewithal to bring a lawsuit. But if you were to have a place, a depository, if you will, for folks to submit some very serious complaints of lack of service or similar and pool those to see, you know, what is, what are we looking at? And I don't know if there's ever been a class actions lawsuit regarding mental health, um, lack of services, but so I guess that's my main question, because, you know, is there a place where people, families can go where their complaints can really be heard, you know, beyond the EEOC or the, not the EEOC, but the recipient rights and, and that? I'll respond to that, Kate. One of the things that you're, you're asking is about, you know, who can help these families or individuals? Um, I was talking earlier about KB versus Lion, and I was talking about Disability Rights Michigan. I mean, the protection and advocacy system is probably one of the, you know, one of the best places to go. They do have priorities, and you can't, you can't, um, if, if a family or an individual reaches out to them, 
their services are based on their priorities, which are established by advisory boards that they have. But there are administrative complaint processes outside of the Office of Recipient Rights that families can also utilize. Um, I think the best way, though, and Stephanie was alluding to this, is through collective grassroots efforts. Grassroots, you know, the people themselves, um, when they've decided that they've sort of had enough of things not working, when they start speaking up as a group, they can be very effective. Uh, there's a group called Advocates for Mental Health of Michigan Youth. Um, started off with three moms. I was actually connected with one of the parents through David Lloyd at the Kennedy Forum. And this is a group that's started as a private Facebook group, and they're very organized. They have their own website now. But anyway, they started off as three, and now they have, I believe, over 350 families from across the state who are struggling with some issue with mental health for their children and youth that have significant behavioral health conditions. So there's a variety of ways to attack these issues, if you will. I think it's about figuring out the best strategy and then getting the attention of people who can provide some assistance to you in your in your cause. And MHAM, we do a lot of that. We do a lot of um, primarily right now we're doing a lot of work helping families who have children or youth to know how to navigate the public mental health system and what to do when you believe or your, your youth, your loved one should be getting served by the system and is not getting served. Or if you are getting served, what do you do when services um, aren't working the way that they're supposed to be? I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it did. And, and it would be helpful too with these grassroots efforts if there was a way to see what grassroots efforts are under in process now so that if you were, you know, there would be might be something to, that you could join if it was in your mm -hmm. you know area of um, concern. Absolutely, I think to your point, what's helpful is there are different organizations. I mean, like for example, for I hate the term mental health, mental illness. So I use mental health conditions. In addition to the Mental Health Association in Michigan, there's the Association for Children's Mental Health. There's the National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI, um, and they have affiliates. There is also, let's see, let's see, those are the ones that come to the top of my head in terms of focusing pretty much on mental illness specifically. But then there's also, for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, it's been mentioned, the ARC Michigan, and they have affiliates. Um, and then also there's the Autism Alliance. Um, there's the Alliance for Families. I mean, there's a lot of groups, but I think it's about bringing them all together to advocate for, for things. And so I can put um, in the chat box the, the group we're working with, and they do have a website, Advocates for Mental Health of Michigan U. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thanks, Marianne. You're welcome. Um, Pam has a question about the federal public health emergency, people losing Medicaid. Pam, I don't have an answer to your question. I don't know enough about that um, regarding people losing Medicaid. So that's something I would have to look into. Um, Stephanie, do you know anything about that? I'm sorry, but I do not. Well, the what's been happening is some people who would have normally been dropped off of Medicaid have been able to stay on Medicaid due to the federal public health emergency. Mm -hmm. And when it ends, there's a lot of people and agencies concerned about where are people going to get the help they need. And we know the certified community behavioral health clinics is one place, but they don't have enough staff to pick up the, I mean, we don't even know when it's going to end, so. Yeah, so those are really good um, questions. I'll, I'll take a look at that, Pam. Thanks for, for bringing that up. Marianne, there's a, um, uh, a notification of Sarah ending. Uh, that's COVID era relief, whatever A stands for, ending in September. 
and they put okay. out a, an announcement. I'll send it to you and you can send it on to people. It's in the Advocacy Digest that I just released from NAMI Washington, oh. if you'd like to look it up there. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much. And Judge Mack posted some good information in the chat as well. So there is there's a lot of national efforts right now. I mean, even Congress is looking at allocating funding to help with children and youth mental health. So we know that there's a lot going on. I think it's a matter of how do you centralize the information so that it's easily accessible because there is so much going on. Do want to invite you to take a look at not only our website we if you haven't been on it we updated it last year but also to look at mental health america's website they have a lot of good stuff on their website so i encourage you to do that as well does anybody have any other questions or comments because i'm noticing that it's almost two o'clock and I'd like for us to be able to end on time and also want to say thank you for joining us. Um, I also want to put a um, shout out about, you know, our memberships. We do have membership. Um, they're, they're very inexpensive. Um, every month we publish um, an online or an electronic newsletter uh, that goes out with a lot of updates for you. As you can imagine, it's really difficult to keep abreast of everything that occurs within the mental health space. I mean, one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about, and I, I think we're going to have to resurrect them next year, is MHAM, along with the Michigan Psychiatric Society, uh, we've been working on some mental health parity bills that got introduced Actually, yeah, they, they were introduced back in June, but I'm with all the limited session days, not sure where those, those are going to go. We're also working on psychiatric residential licensure so that providers um, who have specialty care, for example, um, in providers that want to provide treatment for eating disorders um, or personality disorders, right now we want this licensure so that um, private insurers will pay for people to get treatment for those conditions in our state. Those of you that have loved ones or know anybody with eating disorders or personality disorders or those types of conditions, we don't have anything like that in our state that a commercial insurer like a Blue Cross or a Priority Health will necessarily pay for. And so in 2023, we're working on uh, some language now, but the goal is to really kind of push for that so that we can expand the continuum of care. Um, also, I know it's 201, I'll quickly wrap up here, but my understanding is that the language or the rules for the crisis stabilization units, which are, um, the, the bill was actually signed into law last year by Gretchen Whitmer. This was legislation sponsored by Mary Whiteford, the CSUs, as we call them, can be places where individuals in, you know, in the middle of a psychiatric crisis can go and hopefully get treatment for a short period of time and won't need to be necessarily end up in a hospital unless that's where they need to be. We've been waiting on that. So it's my understanding that the rules are going to be put out soon for public comment. And then we do have another bill in Michigan that was signed into law for psychiatric residential treatment facilities for children and youth under the age of 21. I believe that's in the rulemaking process as well, but I'm not as clear about where it is. Um, so, and one last question, what about Medicaid covering ABA for individuals older than 22? Unfortunately, um, the benefit that we have under Medicaid was a result of a federal lawsuit. So right now it's 21 and under. I'm not sure what it would take to change it to 20, to change it to older than 22. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. It was um, great seeing so many of you. I hope this was helpful. Um, I believe you know how to reach out to us. You can reach out to Kristen. We'd be happy to answer any questions and if anything changes, anything happens, which in mental health, we could be talking about something today and it could be completely different tomorrow, we will definitely let you all know. So thanks for being with us and thanks for being here. Mm -hmm.